So uh, today I have the honor of introducing our four guest speakers from our own Keck USC departments of audiology, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. So we have Dr. Elena Bassett, who uh, many of you may know as our audiologist. She's an assistant professor of clinical otolaryngology, and she deals with patients um, with dizziness and imbalance for vestibular dysfunction, um, and she's also the director of the USC Balance Center, in addition to all of her other responsibilities as, as an audiologist. We also have Dr. Lindsay Reeves, who is an assistant professor of clinical occupational therapy. She treats patients with pain, chronic headache, and also works in the college student and ergonomic program. Uh, we have as well Dr. Lisa Bayek, who is a clinical instructor of physical therapy. She sees patients on an outpatient and inpatient basis. As a board certified neurologic specialist, uh, she works with those who have neurologic, um, vestibular, and chronic headache conditions. Uh, and lastly, we have Dr. Lori Canoza, uh, who's a, an assistant professor of clinical physical therapy, and she also works with patients with neurologic, vestibular, and chronic headache conditions. All four of our faculty members are the um, uh, make up the or are part of the USC chronic headache interdisciplinary team. Um, so we are very fortunate to, to have them uh, today to teach us about multidisciplinary management of dizziness. Uh, we are very lucky to have such high caliber faculty members um, who can help us in managing some of the uh, inherently very challenging dizzy patients that we that we have to deal with. So with that, please let us welcome our team of uh, Dr. Bassett, Dr. Reeves, Dr. Bayek, and Dr. Ganoza. Well, thank you, Dr. Kung, for that introduction. And I think all of us are very happy to be here today to talk to you about the um, opportunities and or interventions that we can provide for our patients with dizziness. And I'm going to start off our lecture series today um, to look at how audiology is meeting the needs of these patients and performing the diagnostic assessment necessary in order to support some of the rehabilitative and habilitative um, courses that these patients may need in their care plan. So with that, our audiologic evaluation for symptoms of dizziness um, stems from the goal of determining the status of the vestibular organs and their contribution to the overall balance system. You may have patients return to you after me that describe their symptom or their balance system as a triangle. And that's really how I try to focus on the assessment process and or the description of this system to patients when they come into my office. This triangle is composed of our visual system, our vestibular system, and our somatosensory system. And each of these individual components is integrated and weighted in a way where we can move safely from point A to point B um, in our day-to-day -day activities. With our balance system, the vestibular system, the visual system, and the somatosensory system are the sensory components, meaning that they're taking the information from the outside world and bringing it into our, um, our brain to be processed appropriately. With the balance system, our goals are to appropriately weight and or integrate this information so we can make the correct balance uh, modifications as we move through our day. But with that, the visual system and the somatosensory system are modifiable depending on the environment that we may interact with. If we're walking on the beach, the sand beneath our feet is going to provide inaccurate sensory information to our somatosensory system. Therefore, we are going to be more dependent on our visual system and our vestibular organs. When we rise in the evening to use the restroom and perhaps have no lights on in our home, our visual system is not going to receive adequate input. Therefore, we have that kind of wall surfing activity where we stick out our arms and use our somatosensory system in order to determine the position of our body in space with our vestibular organs. Our vestibular organs, however, 
are supposed to remain constant. They are responsible for interpreting the position of our head in space relative to gravity, and gravity does not necessarily change too, too often or ever, hopefully. So with that, when a patient is presenting with concerns of dizziness or unsteadiness related to the vestibular system, it's imperative for us to determine at what part of the system we are having a change in function and how that is influencing their interpretation of their body's movement through these challenging environments. I'm finding that in my practice, patients are presenting with some similar or some unique uh, cases as we have entered a global pandemic and patients are finding themselves in a much smaller world in working from home in rarely venturing out to go to the grocery store the environments that we are finding ourselves in have changed and as a result the presentation of symptoms of dizziness and unsteadiness have changed as well and we also have more time to focus on these symptoms an example of this is a patient I saw a few weeks back who was experiencing sensations of a rocking or bobbing dizziness, where he indicated that this was associated with incredible tension through his neck and shoulders. The patient had been um, active in his environment, but had recently withdrawn from any type of physical activity as it exacerbated his symptoms of dizziness. And he noted that although he wanted to do these activities, he was too fearful to attempt um, because the symptoms of rocking and bobbing made him so nauseous. In conjunction with that, he was working from home. Um, like many people that we are seeing now, his children were also completing online coursework. And as a result, he had no place to work within his house. So he was finding himself laying on the floor or sitting on his bed to work on his computer for eight or more hours a day. When this patient presents to us with symptoms of dizziness, we're concerned about vestibular, visual, and somatic. But the integration of that input through the cerebellum and the brainstem, and the organization to create the correct motor output of the eyes, um, and the postural response through our lower limbs and core, um, is something that we want to further explore and seek to solve through a series of tests and batteries. So our components of the vestibular system would be explored through our vestibular test battery, which your patient would visit with me to complete. This includes a assessment that would evaluate now all five vestibular organs to both the right and left side for a 10 organ total assessment. And this is something that we were striving to achieve when I came on board a couple of years ago. And you may notice that this slide looks very similar to the presentation I gave um, at our house presentation very early on uh, coming on board. I'm happy to say now that with our assessment, we can look at all three semicircular canals, interpreting angular motion of the head, as well as the two otolithic organs, the sacral and the utricle, providing information about the linear displacement of the head through space. I'm moving up and down on the elevator. I'm moving forward and back on the skateboard. Not only can we speak to the function of these organs, we can also look at the function across frequency, meaning across head movement. With the integration of rotary chair and video head impulse testing, with caloric irrigation, I can look at low frequency, mid frequency, and high frequency vestibular input. As a result, we can better monitor patients who may be participating in rehabil or participating in um, therapeutics that may be vestibular toxic or ototoxic in nature, and have a better understanding of how disease processes such as Meniere's disease may be impacting their vestibular system. Where does this take place? Well, I'm in a new location with new equipment. So if you haven't seen me, um, I'm still here. I'm just hidden away now. So in our new location, we have uh, the opportunity to have a one-stop shop for vestibular assessment and uh, audiologic testing. So a patient can see me for a audiogram and a VNG with the other comprehensive tests on the same day. Um, here you'll see our VNG goggles. So they're one size fits all, fitting heavy on the face, but they provide us a nice picture of the eyes and any abnormal eye movements a patient may be displaying. 
on this stand here is all of the testing that I just discussed, where we have our caloric irrigation, a part of that VNG battery. We have our VEMP testing for that vestibular evoked myogenic potential, looking at our otolithic organs. And this little chair here that looks like a movie theater seat almost, that's our rotary chair. If you're familiar with a more classic rotary chair in that large enclosed structure, the technology has actually improved where we can have a patient simply sit in this relatively small chair. They wear a seatbelt. The goggles go over their eyes with a dark cover. And by turning off the lights in the room, I create that dark enclosure where we can perform that rotational assessment. If you ever stop by, uh, let me know and I'll give you a free spin in the chair. It's actually quite fun and gives us some good information about our balance system. Where is this location? It's at the Health Resource Association building or that HRA building on Marengo Street. Not only does it house audiology in regards to balance assessment, but also the Crusoe Family Center for Childhood Communication as well. So our pediatric audiologists are housed here. In addition to that, I am lucky to have my peers in physical therapy and occupational therapy within the same building. So not only do we have a chance for a one-stop shop for in-person assessment, what we have found is this has created a lot of organic collaboration between us because now we see each other in the hallways and have an opportunity to chat about patient cases. Um, when we consider this, we are obviously in the physical location, yet with our current expansion of telemedicine services and the ability to reach patients um, in their homes for their rehabilitative needs, which I'm sure um, occupational therapy and physical therapy will talk more about, our reach is wider and our opportunity to capture patients across Southern California has grown. So it's, it's, a, it's a cool opportunity to be in the same physical space but also be aware of the resources that are within our system. There's also free patient parking, which is an incredible perk um, that many patients enjoy uh, at the end of the day. When your patient would come to this building to visit with me for their vestibular assessment, I aim to complete a comprehensive vestibular assessment and it's often ordered with an audiogram. If your patient has not undergone an audiogram within the past six months and or has changes to their hearing that or changes to hearing or tinnitus or aural fullness that are perceived with their symptoms of dizziness, I'm going to want to complete that assessment. During this time, we have two hours to complete a comprehensive case history with um, standardized questionnaires from the dizziness handicap inventory, activity specific balance competence scale, and dizziness catastrophizing scale. We'll complete an audiogram with airbone and speech, so comprehensive in nature, as well as tympanometry. We'll complete if, uh, complete if allowable with the patient's um, presentation, VEMP testing for cervical and ocular VEMP, looking at that saccule and utricle. We'll proceed with a full VNG, which includes that oculomotor battery positioning testing, looking at um, the possibility of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and positionals, which is a component of the VNG. We will work through a caloric irrigation and if time allowing, or if based on the patient's presentation, V hit and rotary chair. So it's two hours. It is a um, comp, like very quick, but informative experience. And we try to answer all of the patient's questions throughout and following the assessment. So with that, it is a test where patients have to really come to work. Um, in, preparing your patient, in, in preparing your patient for this assessment, it's always important to let them know that they may experience symptoms of dizziness, but if they are to experience these symptoms, they are controlled and purposeful. My goal is never to have a patient leave feeling so ill that they cannot move through the rest of the day. Any type of dizziness that we elicit here is physiologic in nature, so it should have a time course that will taper off. Um, with that, patients are often anxious based on the, just the presentation of dizziness, but also anxious that I may make them worse during this test. Let them know that we will experience some dizziness, but it is all normal and or controlled for the test that we are going to do. So who's a good candidate for vestibular testing? 
we find that patients who are chronic patients really are the best candidates for a diagnostic vestibular assessment with me. We're determining the site of lesion, the extent of involvement. We are accessing the system to decide at a central level, has the patient compensated appropriately? Are they integrating eye movements the way that they should for static positions when their head is still? Or are they compensated to a dynamic level where with head movement, we are able to organize our eyes appropriately relative to our vestibular system involvement? With this, it helps us make an informed prognosis and facilitates the design of vestibular rehabilitation. If Lori and Lisa know that the patient is statically compensated for vestibular concerns, but is having increased difficulty with dynamic movement, they can start the vestibular imbalance rehabilitation therapy at a level that is most appropriate for the patient. Also diagnosis and treatment of BPPV, which is one of my favorite activities, um, gives us a chance to provide that patient and uh, maybe a quick intervention as well as some at-home exercises to complete to resolve that benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, monitoring for vestibulotoxic drugs, as well as documenting any bedside abnormalities that you may pick up in your assessment. If the patient has a presentation of congenital nystagmus, sending them in for a recording of the eye movement simply with the ocular motor battery can be beneficial. Appropriate or appro candidates that aren't appropriate are candidates in this acute phase. We want to always rule out the heart and any or cardiovascular and any neurologic factors prior to sending to a vestibular assessment. Um, I know that the wait time for neurology and cardiology can take some time, and this is more in regards to in that inpatient setting. If they've attended the ER, checking on that heart and the brain before sending them for an evaluation of their ear. They need to have their symptoms controlled, um, preferably without the use of any meclizine or vestibular suppressant. It's very challenging to make it through a vestibular test if the patient is unable to open their eyes or incredibly nauseous and vomiting. It's happened before. So order an appointment and follow up. Um, we'll do an outpatient consult to audiology, a VNG with audio if you need an audiogram or an outpatient or consult to audiology, VNG without audio. That's the appointment type that you'll like to order so the patient gets directed to me. And I will request a follow-up appointment with the referring provider because as an audiologist, I am unable to make referrals or direct referrals, and I need your help connecting patients to our other resources um, at USC. So with that, in my report, you'll often find a recommendations list. We'll have the patient follow up with you and consider any further evaluation for testing for any concerns that I might see in regards to neurology or cardiology. But you may see that I recommend vestibular imbalance or rehabilitation therapy or occupational therapy based on the patient concerns. For the patient that I talked about to start, he was having incredible difficulty sleeping and having incredible difficulty managing his stress and was working on his bed like a cocktail shrimp almost for eight hours a day while trying to complete a very technical IT job. He'd be an excellent candidate for occupational therapy, following up with sleep management, stress management, and ergonomics. Also, in withdrawal from his activities and the fear of completing these activities for exacerbating his symptoms, he would be an excellent candidate for vestibular imbalance rehabilitation therapy, which would take place in physical therapy, looking at the functional performance of the patient. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Dr. Reeves to discuss more about the occupational therapy services offered here at USC. Thank you, Elena. Um, I think that is a really nice transition to OT and just really demonstrates how, um, how great the collaboration between audiology, OT, and PT has been just being able to recognize when it's appropriate to refer to either one of our services. Um, so thank you. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, for occupational therapy treatment for dizziness, um, just that background was really helpful, Elena, thank you. But what we do know is that the impact of dizziness is um, correlated with decreased quality of life, higher rates of disability, 
um, reduced productivity. The, the patient that Elena just spoke about, I'm sure because of the dizziness and just environmental factors, um, the ability to get through a workday is likely pretty challenging. Um, and essentially a disruption in the patient's ability to engage in their daily activities. And so as occupational therapists, our goal and our focus is really looking at how this condition of vestibular disorders and dizziness is impacting a person's ability to engage in the things that they want and need to do every day. And so what we do is we evaluate that impact. How, how is it interfering with their daily activities? Um, and then our treatment intervention focuses on adaptive, compensatory, and modifying strategies to help them get back to those meaningful activities. Um, and not only just addressing like the physical impact of dizziness, but also the psychosocial impact of living with this disorder. Um, and it's really important as part of our evaluation process that we're explaining the goals of our program, which is really to focus on improving function, um, quality of life and self-efficacy and their ability to manage their symptoms. Um, and really also focusing on some of those lifestyle factors like sleep, stress management, um, ergonomics and body mechanics and things like that. So some of the specific interventions, yeah, you can go to the next slide, thank you, um, that we focus on. And this is, you know, some of them, not, not all of them, but these are the ones that are most common um, is really diving into things like trigger identification, sim strategies for symptom management, um, fall safety and home evaluations, uh, body mechanic and ergonomic training. Um, if dizziness is interfering with any of their ADLs and IADLs, we would look at, you know, ADL retraining, adaptive equipment training, um, and even just strategies for modifying their daily routines. Um, another big one is activity pacing and energy conservation with the high prevalence of stress and anxiety. Um, that's another area that we address. And then also looking at community school and work reintegration because of that fear of engagement um, is very common. We want to make sure that we provide patients with some strategies to get back to those activities. So I'll dive a little bit more into those specifically. Um, First though, we of course do an initial occupational therapy evaluation, which involves really taking like an occupational profile, understanding, getting a picture of their symptoms and their medical history, but also what their current daily habits and routines are. And so this is really just through a semi-structured interview, we wanna get a, a, a sense of what's going on in a typical day for the patient. Um, and then beyond that occupational profile, these are some of the outcome measures that we use. So if there is a history of falls or fall risk is a concern, we may go through any one of these fall risk assessments. Um, if mental health comorbidities are identified, we would also administer some mental health outcomes, the Beck Depression Inventory, PHQ-9 or GAD-7. Um, and then also just getting a picture of their quality of life through the RAND SF36. And then a occupational therapy specific outcome measure is the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, where it really gets the patient involved in goal setting and identifying what are the areas that their dizziness is impacting um, and having them rate how well they feel like they're performing. Let's say they identify work um, or they're having a hard time showering safely. Um, we would have them rate how well they're performing it and how satisfied they are with those activities currently. Um, and with all of these measures, then we reassess them after treatment um, to see how those, how occupational therapy has impacted um, those areas. So just to dive a little bit deeper into those interventions specifically. So I will typically start with um, patient education around dizziness and vestibular disorders, but then helping them get involved, if they're not already, and doing some symptom monitoring, um, tracking, and helping them identify any triggers or patterns in their onset of dizziness. You know, depending on patient levels of awareness when they get up to OT, um, some patients are really aware of 
things that might influence their symptoms and other patients really have no awareness at all because they don't want to pay attention to those things. Um, but because in occupational therapy, so much of our treatment is focused on behavior change and, and implementing these strategies and recommendations that can improve their overall health and well-being, it's really a great starting point to get them more involved in that process by tracking and recognizing on their own what are, what are the triggers, what are the things to be looking out for. Um, so we can give them a variety of symptom tracking tools, um, whether it's just tracking the dizziness onset or their activity levels, um, falls that might happen, also medications, all of those things can influence it. Um, and then a, another big part of that too is, is addressing medication routine and adherence. Um, that can be preventative. And so um, we want to make sure that patients are taking medications as prescribed and helping them adhere to their um, recommended routine for that. Then if fall safety and, and fall risk is identified in the evaluation, um, we might dive into safety and prevention measures. So first, again, kind of starting with patient education around what are the factors that could be influencing their fall risk, um, whether those are the physical risk factors of changes in body systems and function, um, changes in vision, sensory changes, um, cognitive changes or muscle weakness, sedentary behaviors, all of those things could be physical risk factors. Um, exploring the behavioral factors that could lead to falls, inactivity, medication side effects, um, depression, alcohol use, you know, any of those variables. And then also looking at the environmental context and those risk factors as well. Um, and if that's a concern, if that's where their falls are happening, we would also dive into doing home evaluations, um, again, using specific outcome measures and assessment tools that help us identify where those specific risk factors lie um, and making environmental modification recommendations, removing rugs, um, reducing clutter, also just training them in the use of assistive devices um, safely in their home, grab bars, shower benches, things like that. Um, and then again, looking at how they're performing their ADLs and IADLs and making sure that it's not in a way that is contributing to their risk of falls. Beyond um, fall safety and prevention, another area that um, is commonly identified as a risk factor or maybe in that tracking patients notice that, you know, whenever I overdo it in an activity or whenever I'm really stressed and just kind of push through my symptoms, my symptoms worsen. So pacing and energy conservation is a very common um, area that we address with this patient population. And these strategies can fall into one of three categories. So pacing strategies are really going to focus on um, finding opportunities to take breaks throughout their activities, uh, finding more of a balance in their day. So kind of shifting between physical, emotional, and cognitive activities or high demanding, moderate, and low demanding activities. Um, and really just helping kind of patients pay attention throughout their activities so that they're reducing that risk for overexertion. Um, those two other slides should say energy conservation and energy optimization. Um, and so energy conservation is really focusing on how can we maybe perform an activity differently? How can we modify the way that we're approaching the task so that it's less energy demanding? And maybe that's through doing things seated versus standing or delegating tasks or modifying our environmental setup of the task. Um, and then lastly, energy optimization strategies are going to dive into really evaluating fluctuations in energy throughout the day and how to plan patients' activities in a way that aligns with their own personal energy trends and, and variability in their energy levels throughout the day. 
Um, as Elena mentioned, and as we know with this population, stress, anxiety, and depression can be very prevalent. Um, dizziness can be triggered by anxiety because of the autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And so if we can manage stress and anxiety better, we can hopefully reduce the onset of those dizziness symptoms. Um, so the process that we work on with patients is, again, first starting with that awareness piece, helping them recognize what are the things that trigger stress, what are the signs and symptoms of stress for them? That's a very kind of individualized thing that people don't always recognize. Are they noticing um, kind of those physiological changes of the racing heart or shortness of breath? Or does stress present itself more um, cognitively, changes in their thought patterns or how they're feeling emotionally? So helping them evaluate that and then training them in any of these um, stress management and self-regulation interventions, whether it's relaxation techniques that physiologically are going to shut off that um, sympathetic nervous system uh, or diving more into those cognitive based interventions that help to really modify maybe cognitive distortions and replace those with more adaptive thoughts. Um, and then also just other health promoting coping strategies which um, might just be more about those daily routines, exercise, getting sunlight exposure, um, engaging in enjoyable activities. So there's a whole host of stress management and self-regulation strategies that we review with patients. And I think it's really important that they have a variety of tools in their toolbox um, to help them manage any situation that they're in. Another good example of how and why stress management and those pacing strategies are so important is oftentimes when we do that initial evaluation with patients, they present with this first process of expressing fear and worry about the onset of dizziness, um, not having a sense of control over that. And that can lead to those fear avoidance behaviors, not going into the community or not engaging in those tasks that they used to enjoy. Um, and as a result of that, it can lead to social isolation, which can exacerbate symptoms of depression and anxiety, um, less participation, and that can further muscle weakness and further increase their risk of falling. And so our goal in OT is by giving them these tools and improving their self-efficacy and helping them plan activities in a different way, um, the goal is that with those strategies, by implementing them during their functional activities, then they can experience successful participation in those activities without exacerbating their symptoms. And that can lead to better self-efficacy, more engagement, and redu reduced anxiety and depression. So that's kind of the shift we want to see by providing those um, strategies and interventions for these patients. And then lastly, um, just to highlight on community reintegration, um, just helping patients get back to those activities. So there's a variety of things we can do. Um, accommodations are something we always help patients with, kind of in that advocacy role, helping patients identify what are some accommodations that would be useful for them that would allow them to engage in their work in school um, while also managing their symptoms. So we very often will provide support letters for patients. Um, also just working through like an activity that they might wanna engage in the community and really coming up with a very specific pacing and self-management plan for them so that they can independently implement that, carry over the learned strategies, and again, experience that successful participation. Uh, we might also train them in some self-advocacy and assertive communication strategies if that's one of the barriers that's kind of preventing them from participating in the community. Um, and then again, problem solving through any environmental barriers that could be a risk factor as well. So that's kind of an overview of most of the, the treatment interventions that we would do in occupational therapy. And so to help you identify when it would be appropriate to refer to OT, um, if any of these things listed here come up in your evaluation with a patient, that might be the cue to say, oh, OT could help with that. So if they don't have great awareness of their symptom patterns and onset and triggers, that's an area we can definitely work on. If that, if that, fall risk or history of falls is present, um, 
Also, if mental health comorbidities are not being well managed and patients aren't actively coping with the stress and anxiety that they're experiencing because of their dizziness symptoms. Um, also, kind of on either end of the spectrum, if a patient's reporting like I'm overdoing it and I just push through my symptoms and I ignore them, or if they're avoiding things because of the dizziness, either end of that spectrum could warrant a referral to OT to really work on those pacing strategies. Um, and then lastly, if they're presenting with poor daily self-care and health management routines, those exercise, sleep, um, stress management, if any of that isn't well managed, um, we, we take that lifestyle redesign approach. So we're really working on modifying those health behaviors. As far as our location, we have a few um, different offices. We are, all, we are located in the health, the HRA building. Um, we also have an office um, on UPC in the Angman Student Health Center, as well as in the USC Downtown Clinic. Um, currently, we are providing our services 100% remotely through telehealth. Um, and so, like Elena said, we've been really able to uh, widen our reach and access more patients during this time, which the patients are really um, appreciating and enjoying. Uh, we do require a referral. And so, um, like Elena said, she's not able to directly refer to us. And so, we do need a physician's referral in order to initiate treatment. Um, and we do accept um, PPO, Medicare, and self care self-pay plan. So um, yeah. And lastly, just as far as how to refer to occupational therapy, um, these are the steps you would follow in Cerner. Um, you would add a new, go to orders, add a new order, and you would search OP consult to OC, meaning occupational therapy. Um, and then in the reason for referral, you would just indicate um, lifestyle redesign. That is our clinic at the occupational therapy faculty practice. Um, and then that way we would receive that referral on our end. We would contact the patient for scheduling um, and hopefully get them in as soon as possible. I should also just say really quickly that our services, we typically see people once a week for about an hour um, for anywhere from four sessions to 12 sessions, kind of just depending on what the patient's needs are. But it's a really nice opportunity to um, build a relationship and kind of help patients implement any of the recommendations that are coming from physicians um, in a meaningful way. We really focus on that behavior change piece so that the carryover and the implementation is, is there. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to physical therapy. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so, Lori, Ganoza, and I are going to now talk about the physical therapy management for dizziness. Okay. So, um, defining our role with vestibular physical therapy, and more so, um, is to utilize exercise, education, and other modalities to help improve balance or to reduce risk for falling. Um, we try to improve a patient's ability to perform exercise activities and exercises, and to assess um, different factors that can influence someone's dizziness and to lower the impact that the dizziness may have. Um, so we try to help guide the patient with the um, realization that maybe their dizziness may require other resources as well, um, such as with um, our colleagues' occupational therapists or even psychologists, such as if anxiety or depression may be contributing or causing their symptoms. So these are the common symptoms that um, we can potentially help with, including dizziness, neck symptoms, imbalance, headache, um, including post-concussion and vestibular migraine, as well as falls. Our first evaluation is um, one hour, and our follow-ups are typically anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, um, depending on the plan of care. Um, so, and there are many systems that we attempt to um, investigate during our physical examination, which we can kind of go over in this slide. Um, the neuro exam, not all inclusive in this slide, um, maybe something we perform for the screening of red flags and appropriateness of physical therapy, but also to just gain and um, assess brain function. 
The ocular motor, we look at it more from kind of the standpoint of seeing how these tests can relate back to the patient's functional complaints as well as for qualitatively. So for example, let's say if someone has impaired smooth pursuit, um, we're looking at how this can um, how the smooth pursuit uh, test can impact um, and re relate back to their complaints of dizziness, such as if their complaint is dizziness with reading or from when looking from one place to another. Um, so we're also with these tests um, looking at symptom reproduction and provocation during testing to be able to help um, assess a patient's irritability, which can guide our interventions. So we can. We also look at um, when we're doing some of these vestibular tests, not only just looking at kind of how they are performing and is it a positive or negative test, but also how much are their symptoms are being reproduced. Um, for the cervical spine, we are assessing different cervical range as well as strength measurements to be able to capture um, whether a patient has symptoms related to head versus the neck movements, and to further investigate um, whether it's a vestibular or possibly a cervicogenic dizziness um, that they're presenting with. So for the functional and gait measurements, uh, we are looking at outcome measures that can quantify someone's fall risk, such as with the TUG and FGA, which um, research has given us kind of a cutoff for fall risk um, based on their scores. Um, the FGA also provides us an opportunity to watch the patient move and analyze their movement um, while their vestibular system may be being challenged. So for example, one part of that test involves evaluating how well a patient is able to ambulate while turning their head. For the balance, we um, are going into further testing with cer certain um, multiple environments as well as conditions. So um, one of our go-to measurement might be the modified SITSID, which is the balance assessment that looks at how well a patient could maintain um, postural stability and balance, either with a visual system or somatosensory system in, um, that is limited. So such as their standing with eyes closed on either the even ground or they may be standing with eyes open on uneven ground um, with a foam pad or with eyes closed on that foam pad just to see what systems they may be utilizing the um, over utilizing or under utilizing. So um, and then for let's say a patient with post concussion we're also able to test um, and measure possibly their physiological response to walking or exercise. Okay, so this is a, um, so this is a functional test of the vestibular system. Um, I don't know if the video, okay, great. Um, so the analogy that we like to give to our patients when we do this test is that we are trying to maybe even look at the software rather than just the hardware function of the vestibular system. So if you look at the video, the um, physical therapist shakes the patient's head side to side um, while the patient is reading that eye chart. So they're reading it out loud and we're looking for a comparison of the visual acuity with head still versus with head moving. Normal is about one to two line difference, and greater than that, we interpret as interpret as a patient having impaired vestibular integration or processing. Okay, and this is um, how we measure someone's cervical joint proprioception um, with the joint position error. Error. So with this test, we're looking at with eyes closed using a laser and target on the wall, um, with how a patient is able to, uh, if a patient is able to align their um, head and neck back to midline. And we can assess, assess this um, in both sitting as well as standing to see if there's a difference. Um, and to help guide whether a patient may be presenting with possibly a mismatch between um, their vestibular and cervical system. So this somatic, um, I think, goes back to what Dr. Bassett um, nicely introduced with us as a, and described it as a triangle. Um, so this is kind of the way that we 
think about the vestibular system. Um, we have the sensory input that's integrated within the brain, then to produce a motor output as a reaction for postural alignment and balance. So during our exam, we're trying to um, assess kind of these three different um, systems. So with the sensory input of the vestibular, visual, and proprioception, such as with that joint position error um, in the modified sitsa. And we're assessing the integration possibly using different coordination testing, such as with to see their cerebellum function. And then we also can observe motor output clinically as well as with using movement analysis and to see what strategies um, that a patient may be using for their balance, motor output. So using these testing methods, um, we're essentially trying to tease out where the breakdown may be happening in our patient's balance. So if we think about our patient with um, um, post-acoustic neuroma resection, um, we know that there may be a, uh, there's a vestibular hypofunction that's happening, but then we are trying to see if we can uptrain and adapt that vestibular system to improve the overall balance in that patient. Um, for, let's say, in another patient, such as with persistent postural perceptual dizziness, that's a handful, 3PD, who overutilizes the visual system, um, to assist with balance, we may look into how can we improve some of their proprioception um, or such by utilizing grounding techniques or, or help their motor output improve with, you know, strengthening um, endurance exercises to help overall improve someone's ability to balance and navigate their surroundings. Uh, so from an intervention perspective, we're going to take our cues from our exam, really thinking about that chart that Lisa described for us um, to identify where we need to target. Um, so one of the factors is understanding if any of the activities we did um, reproduce their symptoms, and then um, that really guides where we go with our intervention and how we um, modulate the parameters for our intervention. So these are just some categories listed that we would address within um, a patient's plan of care. So from the perspective of um, ocular motor, we can get patients started on simple vision exercises to help improve convergence or help improve their ability to complete smooth pursuit from, to reduce symptoms, um, reproduction with that, um, and help tolerance to maybe read. Um, and then for cervical spine, we can, if we identify that there's any weakness, we'll work on strengthening, certainly um, helping to improve range of motion with that. And if we identify an issue with cervical spine proprioception, we can utilize the similar target to further assist with training in the cervical spine proprioception. We will also address aerobic conditioning as needed, um, dependent on diagnosis, so often very often with our patients with post-concussion, but even in other patients who, as the patient Elena um, presented earlier, maybe is a little bit more deconditioned and just hasn't been engaging well in activities that um, adding an aerobic training program can be helpful for many different factors. Um, and I'm gonna speak more specifically to some of the vestibular, vestibular ocular and functional activities we do. So next slide, please. So from a BPP, the perspective as Elena can do, we will also assess for that with the Dix Hall Pike and provide um, canal repositioning as needed for them. And there's often times where Elena might perform that treatment for an individual, but we'll follow up and make sure it's fully resolved or provide additional treatments if necessary. Um, and we can make modifications to how we assess and treat this because of our table can fold and move in ways that um, allows us to not actually move the or move the cervical spine so we can keep the neck and head in neutral but still achieve the um, required positions to treat assess and treat um, for BPPV. So for to address vestibular ocular function we utilize gaze stabilization we can play the video oh it is playing thank you um, um, called VORI times one and VORI times two. Definitely always utilize for our patients who are post-acoustic neuroma resection or any other patients who have a vestibular hypofunction. So VORI times one, which he's demonstrating there, is to 
hold the letter steady, moving their head side to side, up and down as quickly as they can. And this would be VRR times two. So the head is moving and the target is moving in opposite directions. And we'll do these activities static standing and um, train them to complete this while they're also walking. Um, and we can manipulate um, the variables of how we do this. We do expect that this is going to increase the patient's symptoms. And we actually want that um, increase in symptoms because we know we're challenging the vestibular system at that point. However, we have guidelines that the symptoms shouldn't increase beyond three or four levels above their baseline, and we anticipate and would like symptoms to resolve back down to baseline within 10 minutes. So really modulating, controlling that. From a habituation motion sensitivity, this is probably, you know, the patient that uh, Elena described maybe starting to fit into this sort of category where there's just more motion sensitivity and potentially he's over utilizing his visual system to help with balance. And so in that, we're gonna utilize some gradual exposure to movements that are known to provoke dizziness. Um, and the goal with that is to desensitize their responses to that movement, so improved tolerance to activity. Um, and with this, this is where our OT colleagues are really helpful for us. And I think Lindsay um, stated it really well of having, helping the patients um, reduce their fear avoidance by behavior and to successfully engage in activity without exacerbating symptoms or understanding that they have some control over their symptoms with some activity pacing. And these are just some examples of some balance activities. I don't think, is there a video on this one? Perfect. Um, so there's, we can modify variable conditions. So changing the feet position from feet together tandem to single leg, standing on different surfaces, asking them to do activities while they're walking where their head is moving or we're changing their body orientation. Um, we can change visual input um, by having them do ball toss or close their eyes, um, but being as functional as we can and specific to maybe some of the activities they may need to do in their day-to-day -day life. So for um, physical therapy process for referral, it's gonna be very similar to what um, Lindsay described for us and how you would order outpatient um, consult to this physical therapy. Um, but I'm gonna ask two of my colleagues, Robin Howard, who is the director of USC PT practice management to give us a little bit more about outpatient referral. And then um, Jenny Tanaka, the director of clinical PT at um, CAF for acute rehab can explain a little bit more about how you could request for a PT consult for any of your patients that might be in the hospital and having dizziness. And certainly we could provide some like assessment of vestibular care in um, the hospital if you are suspecting maybe B3V is present. So um, Robin, maybe if you wanna speak really quickly to outpatient referral. Yeah, Lori, thank you. I, I think as far as, and I want to make sure I'm touching on what you want, Lori, as far as the outpatient referral, I, I think definitely you can use the um, system within Cerner that Lindsay had laid out, and it's the exact same thing, except you would just be uh, selecting the outpatient physical, th uh, outpatient um, consult for physical therapy. Uh, and then we're working that queue on a daily basis so that we can get in contact with your patient. So that's really that seamless uh, and, and most efficient way to do it. But of course, if you've got a specific situation, you can um, um, reach out to Lori and Lisa directly if you've got questions. Uh, and of course, Elena, and, and we're all communicating. Um, for physical therapy, we are able to see patients and they can seek out our services on the outpatient uh, side through direct access, which you know, at times then patients are reaching out to us directly uh, and not have seen a physician. Uh, and then often these are patients where we might then send the referral in the opposite direction to get some of your assistance from uh, the physician side, from audiologist side, or directing to neurologist or cardiologist based on what our assessments are. Um, and then I think the other piece that we've done and, and worked uh, closely with is if there is a program like with the acoustic neuro neuroma program, we've set up programs to where we're doing 
pre-op um, sessions um, really to help as a patient is transitioning through the continuum of care. Uh, and that is where Jenny Tanaka and the team on the inpatient side has really been instrumental so that patients are knowing what to expect and we can um, really help with uh, reducing that length of stay uh, by even helping to address patient expectations within the various setting. And then as they're transitioning to the outpatient side, there's uh, fewer delays in getting patients the care that they're needing. Um, so we're more than happy to um, set up times to meet with people and discuss programs and what those needs might be to better tailor it to your specific program. So let us know. I think with that, then Lori, I can turn it over to Jenny if she has anything to add from the acute rehab side or the inpatient acute side. Jenny, really quickly, I just wanted to add one more comment to everything Robin provided, and thank you, Robin, um, was that we are doing in-person and telehealth um, visits at the current moment. Um, so, Jenny, go ahead. So, good morning. Thank you, Lori and um, Lisa for, and the rest of the team for a great presentation. So, the inpatient side is going to be very similar to the referral process. Um, but the other additional component is with the inpatient physical therapy and, and the rehab team, we can also help propose the orders if it becomes difficult. So that can be an easy discussion to help facilitate this process and get the referrals while they're an inpatient and then get them within that queue to help make this a much more streamlined process in, and start this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so last slide, Elena. So I, I think we're going to open it up at this point if you have questions for um, any of us as the presenters. Well, thank you all so much for this talk. This was great and uh, rather eye-opening. It was nice to see the videos and actually see what you guys are, are physically doing with the patients. Um, I had a question about um, uh, the chronic headache interdisciplinary team and uh, what that all entails, um, since a lot of our dizzy patients also frequently have headache or vestibular migraine. Um, so I'd open up to any of you to uh, comment on those. I can start with that. Um, and it's actually our same team here. Um, so with the chronic headache team, we do have monthly meetings with our the physician, the neurologist, OT, PT, and our psychologist. Um, but uh, certainly with from the vestibular migraine perspective, um, this is where I've been working really closely with Elena. Um, so it's back and forth. Sometimes she sees them first and I'll see them second. Um, to really rule out that their dizziness is not coming from any other source, that it's not BPV, it's not some type of peripheral hypofunction, um, that it is more likely vestibular migraine presentation based on um, Elena's results for sure, and or just um, headache presentation itself. Um, so we've been, with Dr. Ravi Kumar, we've been actually traveling the use of Oh, I can't remember the name now off the top of my head, um, but it's a stim vagus nerve stimulator to for acute vestibular. Um, it's an interesting result so far. It does help, but um, so I think there's some really nice things on the horizon for acute vestibular migraine attacks. And I'll just add an occupational therapy. Um, it's a very similar approach where we're addressing some of those same areas. Um, but focusing a little bit more on the lifestyle factors that are known triggers for migraine and headaches. Um, and again, just helping patients get more involved in being able to identify, avoid, and better manage their pain. And to bounce from the audiology perspective, like Lori said, ruling out um, peripheral vestibular system involvement that's not related to perhaps a vestibular migraine presentation. Um, some of the patients with vestibular migraine can have some peripheral vestibular system involvement, but the, um, the patterns of that are distinct from what we might see in a true hypofunction. Um, so making sure that their headache presentation isn't related to the fact that they are going through an acute vestibular crisis, and as a result, that symptom um, presentation is causing them increased motion intolerance and then headache and head pain instead of what we would see in a migraine, uh, vestibular migraine presentation. 
Uh, this is John Ogle. I, I just want to thank you all for giving such a wonderful talk. I learned quite a bit. And uh, this uh, multidisciplinary team is amazing. And I mean, I know you had components of it before, but boy, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for working together like this. This is going to be an incredible service to our patients. And it seems like we're in a position where we should start kind of organizing marketing efforts behind it as well. And so I'm, I'm really proud of what you guys have done. So thank, thank you. And I apologize, I've got to sign off because I've got a 9 a.m. meeting, but I did want to put in the plug for that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, you know where to find me or find us now in the building and via email. Feel free to reach out with us for us for any concerns that you may have. As you saw, there's there's a lot of different parts to each uh, specialty here and how we can integrate together. But there also may be other patients within your uh, workflow who could or who could benefit from occupational therapy or physical therapy services not related to symptoms of dizziness. So thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, have a good day. <laughs>